40,000 Chinese males have crossed the border in the last few weeks, and it's totally open. That crisis is greater to me for American survival than the crisis in Ukraine or the crisis in Israel. Uh, I am uh, for defeating Putin. I think that uh, he is, in fact, uh, the new Adolf Hitler, uh, and that his expansionist goals are very, very, very dangerous. From the standpoint of the survival of the United States, the border is second only to nuclear war as a threat to our very survival. All right, folks. Uh, if you didn't work yesterday, I hope you had a good time. Hope you enjoyed the conversation with Cash Patel. I thought it was really cool. If you didn't, go back, look at YouTube or Apple. Check it out. A really interesting look at how we got to where we are now and, and the way forward in terms of our intelligence, et cetera. But today, the 50th Speaker of the House, Newt Gingrich joins us. He's got a book out called March to the Majority. I'm telling you right now, you will hear it in my question to him. It's my favorite Newt Gingrich book yet. I have been a huge admirer and follower of Newt Gingrich since he got on the scene. What he did to the movement can't be understated. Uh, this book is, if you are a junkie, this is a book that you must read. Uh, I loved it and I've got more things Newt Gingrich than most people. It's it's not healthy to some degree. Uh, so. Without further ado, let's get into what the House majority needs to do, who Trump should pick as VP, and all things 2024 with the 50th Speaker of the House, Newt Gingrich. Speaker Gingrich, always an honor to speak to you. Thanks for being with us. I, I got to tell you, uh, this isn't an exaggeration. I think I've told you this before in your office. Like I have a, a Gingrich shelf on my bookcase, and <laughs> I, I've read them all at least, uh, and I've got them signed. But this one, this one I, was in my wheelhouse, man. I mean, uh, the healthcare stuff, I got to admit, I don't have the same passion as you do for some of the reforms. But you're, this is how, when I say, like, I really like this book, I, A, I learned more about Newt Gingrich as a person than I, and I, and I thought I was a pretty good, uh, I, I thought I had a pretty good understanding of, of who you were in terms of your political upbringing. But man, you, you throw a lot of curves in there. But then this just tells you, just so, and I don't want to dwell on this, but this just tells you what you, you started the book and you start talking about working with Joe Gaylord and all these messages and, and things uh, that you had to go through to do research for the book. And I thought, okay, if, if Speaker Gingrich had to do that for his book, I'm going to do it for the interview. So here is the language of the new majority uh, from, <laughs> from Frank Luntz. Here is the original copy of Flying Upside Down from Gaylord. But then not to be outdone, here is the sequel Flying Right Side Up. I have the GoPack tapes. Uh, we're going to get into that in a minute, but I mean, that's how, when I'm reading this, I kept oh thinking of, of Junior Sean Spicer campaign aide running around Connecticut. Um, and it just, so anyway, I, I like I said, I know when you do an interview, a lot of times people are like, I love the book. I was pulling out bins going, I got to have this ready. My wife's like, please, we put that stuff away. Uh, so let me just, what, what was it that like, I, I kind of read the book thinking, okay, we, we've got a slim majority and we need a roadmap on how to keep it. What, what was your goal in doing this though? You just hit it on the head. I, I looked around and realized that when we did the contract with America in 1994 and elected the first House Republican majority in 40 years and the first reelected majority in 68 years since 1928, that we did it by standing on Ronald Reagan's shoulders. And that Reagan was a unique person who had been an FDR Democrat. He had been a movie star. He had been a union president leading a strike uh, and then became a Republican over time, both over taxation and the size of government and over anti-communism. Uh, but he brought to us all of the strengths of the Franklin Delano Roosevelt New Deal Democrats. He understood the American people. He was confident that what he believed in was what they believed in. And he created a positive, idea-oriented, solution-oriented Republican Party, uh, very different from the negative anti-FDR party that had proceeded. Well, we stood on that. We, I actually helped organize the first uh, contract with America with Reagan in 1980. And we had our first Capitol Steps event in September 1980 with Reagan. 
So what we did in 94 was standing on our shoulders. What hit me a couple of years ago was uh, nobody in the current system uh, understands how we did that. Yeah. So I set out to write uh, with Joe Gaylord, who'd been my partner for 16 years effort and then four years of governing. Uh, we set out to write what's really a cookbook. And it's both a history, but it's also this is how if, if modern Republicans would slow down, read March to the Majority, take it to heart and apply it, uh, they could become a very, very big majority. But it starts with a simple concept, which both Lincoln and Reagan understood, which is listen to the American people, represent the American people. And I think that's a very key part of this. All right, folks, if you're a longtime watcher of the show, you know about my friends at Delta Rescue. Uh, go to deltarescue.org and you can check it out. If you're an animal lover, you're going to want to see the amazing work that they're doing there. And it was all started by a guy named Leo Grillo. I've gotten to know Leo over the, the last several months. He's a great guy that had a mission, which was to give abandoned and malnourished and maltreated animals, dog, cats, horses, a sanctuary, not a shelter. It's a no-kill sanctuary. And if you go to deltarescue.org, there's a bunch of videos on there. If you're an animal lover like I am, I've rescued three dogs. Uh, you you know what I'm talking about. You watch these animals that have been abandoned have a place to roam free to get the nutrition they need, the veterinarian care that they need for life. Now, Leo started this off when he rescued one dog, but it has now become a lifelong mission for them. So if you go to deltarescue.org, you can not only see what they're doing, but you can help them out. And they rely solely on our contributions. There's no government funding, no nothing. It's all you and me and everybody else who's an animal lover out there. So you can give $5 or $100, a thousand, whatever you feel comfortable if you're an animal lover to take care and make this. But you can also go and check out that estate planning kit there and think about making them part of your estate so that this mission that Leo Grillo started can become an enduring one so that dogs, cats, horses can always have a lifelong no-kill sanctuary to be taken care of. Please go to deltarescue.org and help them out. I, I, Like I said, when I mentioned that I learned stuff, I didn't realize that original 19, you know, that, that Reagan-esque steps on the Capitol. And also you explained how it almost didn't happen and that you got a very angry <laughs> phone call saying, young man, what are, what are you doing? You were a freshman congressman. And they were like, let's, let's, be a little less uh, heard than seen. Um, what struck me though was to your point about the, I actually, again, just as a side note, was sort of shocked by how much the Bushes and you had a little tension because of your support of Reagan and his policies. Um, but but I kept thinking about the, the now and what it took for you to pull all this together in the lead up, because the contract just didn't happen in a vacuum. It was that lead up, those years of of cultivating ideas and talking to people, the walks that you took on the mall with members uh, to hear their ideas and thoughts. And I'm thinking, okay, now we have a bunch of members that just want to go out on social media and and be sort of a, an internet star as opposed to a thinker. I think that's right. Look, this is, first of all, I, I have great respect for both Speaker McCarthy and for Speaker Johnson. Um, they faced problems I didn't face. We had, a, we had a big enough majority that I could afford to have eight or 10 people be crazy, and it didn't matter. We could still <laughs> win. Uh, uh, we, uh, we also had earned a great deal of, of, of support by all those years. I mean, at its peak, we had 55,000 people getting GoPack training tapes every month. So then there was a sense people had of our, what, what McCarthy did, which is why I think the rebellion against McCarthy was so uh, outrageous. Uh, he did almost what I did. He crisscrossed the country. He raised $480 million in the last cycle. Uh, he was in virtually every congressional district. Uh, and the perfectionist caucus uh, still decided that even though he had 96 percent, think about that, 96 percent of the Republican conference supported Kevin McCarthy. And eight people decided they had the moral authority to side with the Democrats to destroy his speakership. Now, you look at that and you think, how would you govern? And candidly, I don't know. Now, look at uh, 
Mike Johnson knows that, an even harder problem. He doesn't have McCarthy's years as a leader. He doesn't. He has, hasn't gone out and raised almost a half billion dollars. His margin has gotten narrower uh, with, with uh, resignations and uh, with the expulsion of one member. And so he's, he's there trying to get things done with virtually no majority. Uh, I mean, he's down to maybe two votes. I mean, I candidly, I don't know how I would operate in that environment. Uh, I probably would, would focus on the negative. That is, what, what can I stop? And then I would take the heat for stopping. It. Uh, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, focus on, on achieving great things. Uh, I would focus on stopping big things and recognize that, you know, that's, that's the hand we're dealt. From a leadership perspective, considering how slim the Johnson majority is in the House, is it more effective to use a carrot or a stick? Well, I think, first of all, with the there's a group of members who wake up every morning and they say, I'm voting no today. What's the issue? <laughs> right. Now, so I don't know that a carrot or a stick matters. I mean, uh, with, with donkeys, you can at least get their attention. Uh, but with these guys, I don't think you can get their attention. But it's funny because I kept thinking to myself, freshmen have changed over the years. And when I'm reading the book, here you are, uh, a freshman. I don't even know if you were sworn in at the time. And you're telling the leadership, we, the freshman class, want to interview you before we reelect you or elect you as the next. And I'm thinking, wow, okay. The difference that I saw, and tell me if you think I'm wrong on this, is that your, your test was what's on your agenda to move the conservative can move conservative policies forward. And I think that what I see a lot in the house is less an attempt of getting things done on the agenda than how do I make a bigger name for myself in some cases. Yeah, I, well, I think you have two groups that are causing trouble from the right. One group really are crazy. Uh, there's, you know, you, you take a guy like like uh, like, like Getz, um, it's impossible to deal with him. Uh, he walks around in a uh, room that is a hall of mirrors in which every mirror is him. Um, he couldn't care less. Uh, he gets on TV. He raises money on the Internet. And he is his own one-person moral majority. Um, so there are some people you just can't deal with. And, and uh, those folks, frankly, if I were speaker, I probably wouldn't meet with them. I would just say, look, I understand it. Uh, I, I know exactly where you're coming from. If you ever decide you want to vote yes, I'll meet with you. But I'm not going to meet with you, let you lecture me, and then go out and stab us in the back again. Uh, but, I, but, but I'm like McCarthy. I probably wouldn't last two days as speaker of this particular group. Uh, there's a second group, which is much bigger, who sincerely, deeply, passionately are frustrated, and they want to, and they want to change things. And what they don't quite get yet is that... Uh, Simply screaming no uh, while the machine runs over you uh, is not affecting very much. I mean, it may, maybe makes them morally superior because they didn't go along, but it doesn't, if, you, if, if it's your constant tactic, I mean, my, my question to him would be, show me how we're going to get something done. I, I understand how we can block things, but show me, you know, how are we going to get bills passed? Uh, some of them want to close the government, and my question will be fine. Tell me under what circumstance you think you're going to reopen it, uh, and how long are you going to have it closed? Uh, and, and, and again, I say that I, I closed the government three times, uh, and, and I think we gained from that effort. We became the first reelected majority after in 20, since 1928 after we closed it, but we closed it for a moral purpose. We closed it to get welfare reform. And we closed it in order to get to a balanced budget. And the only four balanced budgets in your lifetime, as you know, came from that Congress. So people looked and said, hey, this is a real fight about a real topic. I did a newsletter at, at uh, Gingrich 360 the other day and pointed out that in, in uh, a project we have, which is called the America's New Majority Project, which people can see at America's New Majority Project.com, overwhelmingly, the American people are worried about our border more than they're worried about Ukraine or Israel. Overwhelmingly, the American people, by about a two-to-one margin, want to have an offset for any spending. Now, if, if the $90 billion that the Senate just passed is that vital, surely in a $6 trillion budget, you can find $90 billion that's less important. Uh, 
That requires holding your ground and looking them in the eye and saying, sure, I'm, I'm totally prepared to pass it as soon as you do things the American people want. Hey guys, you know, when you look at the market these days, it's got its ups and its downs. You always have to worry about what Biden's gonna do, which is why I made a choice to call my friends at Bishop Gold Group. And you can go to bishopgoldgroup.com slash Sean to start your journey with them, to talk about how you can add precious metals into your investment strategy. Now, maybe you just want to invest like I did. Maybe you've got a 401k or an IRA that's sitting on the shelf somewhere from a previous job and you want to roll it over. The cool part is they can have that conversation with you. You can either go to bishopgoldgroup.com slash Sean and you get a free promotion, which I would do because it's free and I like free stuff. Or you can actually even give them a call at one 844 nine eight four one six one six just tell them that sean sent you and have that conversation with them about starting your journey with financial metals with bishop gold group the thing is you're getting hit up all over the place i know it i hear all the commercials the difference is i've talked to a lot of them i had that conversation with bishop gold group they are full of integrity and trust and experience they know what they're doing call them or go to bishopgoldgroup.com slash sean to start your journey your investment strategy with financial metals with them. Gold, silver, platinum, whatever you want, they'll create a strategy that's right for you. Bishopgoldgroup.com slash Sean. Um, you talk about how you made the, con you know, how built the contract and, and laid out these 10 simple items. And you contrast that with the commitment to America that, that Kevin McCarthy laid out. And you said, you know, hey, it was a good effort. I think it was a bit too uh, complicated, maybe too wordy, not as simplistic. And I agree with you on this. It was funny. I had a conversation with McCarthy before he rolled it out and he called in and I think he was just trying to build support. And, and I said to him, where's your bucket? And, and he said, what do you mean by that? And I said, well, when, when Newt Gingrich was campaigning in 94, I remember he came up, I, just, I did a race in Connecticut second district and he walked in, he has an ice bucket and he says, the house gets ice delivered to every office every morning to the tune of whatever it was, a couple hundred grand a year. Because back in the day, there were no refrigerator, no, you know, refrigerators with, with freezers. Now we have them, but some patronage job continues to allow that. It's a waste of taxpayer money. I'll get rid of it. It was a very simplistic symbol to the American people that you were a responsible steward of their tax dollars and willing to look after any. And he said, okay, I'll look into that. And I said, no, no, you, you're, not, you're missing this. The simplicity of it is... The American people need to know that you, in a way that communicates to them that you're caring about their money. I don't get the sense that House Republicans today, I've said this over and over again, the issue of a porous border to me is, is like the easiest thing that you could wish for as a political operative. It touches on fentanyl and how it affects families and communities, terrorism and safety, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I don't feel like they're, they're getting that message of how to communicate in a, same, in a similarly simplistic way. Oh, I think that's right. I also think they don't understand judo. Uh, right now, the establishment, uh, the Senate, uh, the senators who are for the current bill and the president have, have, have this con going of saying it's a House Republicans fault. And they should be using judo and saying, no, if, if, if Joe Biden would agree to sign the budget bill, we, we, well, the border bill, I mean, they already passed H.R. 2. It's already the House passed it. If you would agree to sign it, we could get aid to Ukraine and Israel pretty fast. So why is he blocking aid to Ukraine and Israel by refusing to sign? But I'm perfectly happy. And look, as you know, I mean, I have a PhD in European history. Uh, my dad was a career soldier for 26 years. I was totally supportive of Reagan and, and uh, anti-communism. But I'm, and, and I've been very supportive overall of the military. I'm the longest serving teacher uh, for, for major generals going back to the mid 1980s. Um, I think the crisis on the American border where 40,000 Chinese males have crossed the border in the last few weeks and it's totally open. That crisis is greater to me for American survival than the crisis in Ukraine or the crisis in Israel. And therefore, my view is that fighting to get something done to change, to control the border is the highest possible priority. And I think House Republicans ought to stand there and say that and say I, it every day. Well, what, why aren't they, though? This is what I don't get. This is not, to me, a tough, tough issue. This is literally being handed to them on a silver platter politically and saying this will every American, regardless of their ideology from far left to far right, 
agrees in a in a safe and secure border, agrees that fentanyl shouldn't be coming into the communities, agrees that terrorists shouldn't be coming in. Why I, I just don't understand. Every time I ask a member about this, I get a, you know, we're committed to this. It's it's a nice bunch of gobbledygook. But I would to just stop right. everything else and say, this is the only thing. If we don't have security, we have nothing. This is all we'll focus right. on. And and it's it eludes them. Well, I, I think, I mean, you've asked a very important question. Uh, and one of the great failures of my career, I, I always recommend to people that they should read uh, The Education of Ronald Reagan, which is a book by Tom Evans about Reagan's eight years at General Electric. And I'd worked with Reagan. I first started looking at him in 65. I began working with him in 74. I served in Congress the eight years he was president. I never fully understood how strategic and how methodical he was until I read Evans' book. Uh, I would say that there are, th- I'm making this up, but I think that I think your question is exactly on target, and I wish I had could find a way to say it better. Uh, I think there are three big things. The first is no guts, no glory. It is hard to go on a TV show, and no matter what they ask you, Come back to what you want to say. It was Reagan was brilliant at it. I tried to learn it from him. Uh, and so the first thing you say is, you know, I, I don't know why Joe Biden doesn't want to control the border. I don't know why Joe Biden thinks it's okay to have 40,000 Chinese cross the border. I don't know why Joe Biden thinks it's okay to have a violent Venezuelan gang beating up policemen in New York City. Well, it takes guts to say that and stick with it. And it takes enormous discipline to say it again and again. Reagan once said he had actually not changed since the speech he gave in October of 1964, but eventually the world came around. Uh, and I tell you, you have to have a, as you know, because you're, you're a great communicator, you have to have enormous discipline. And uh, Haley Barber used to say, about the time you're sick of saying it, the average voter is starting to actually hear it. Uh, and so you have to do that. But then the, the last piece I think is just, is just hard earned, skill and knowledge. Um, I've been studying media basically my whole life. Uh, I wrote my first newspaper article when I was 11, as I recount in in the book, March the Majority. I think I did my first radio and TV show uh, sometime in my teenage years in high school. Uh, And so I've really tried to think and understand how you communicate with people and how you deal with people. Almost nobody in the House Republican Party has methodically tried to understand that. Uh, And so while they may get through a particular interview, they don't understand the idea of setting up strategic messages. And I agree with you. I, I, I actually believe from the standpoint of the survival of the United States that the border is second only to nuclear war as a threat to our very survival. And that, uh, yes, I, I am for aid to Israel, and I, I think I was at one time called the most pro-Israeli speaker in American history. Uh, I am uh, for defeating Putin. I think that uh, he is, in fact, uh, the new Adolf Hitler, uh, and that his expansionist goals are very, very, very dangerous. Uh, but if I had to rank them, both of those rank below controlling the American border and saving this country from being just drowned in criminals and an ama- amazingly high percentage of the people coming over are young males of uh, military age. And, and I just, uh, I, I, I want that worries. I, I want to put a pin in this real quick because I want to move on to to Trump and the conventions and stuff. But do you believe I, I, there were circumstances? I get it, and I urge everyone to read the book and understand the the, the evolution of the contract, et cetera. But do you believe that that can be replicated at any point in the near future in terms of gathering ten people? You talk about. McCarthy's efforts. And, and again, I think he was well-meaning and I thought he tried it. It's hard to, to get that many people to agree to anything these days. Do you think it's possible going forward to replicate that effort? Yes. I, th- I think the best hope the Republicans have this year is to focus in on clear messages. Uh, and this may surprise you. I think their messages need to be uh, 30% anger and 70% hope. By the way, that's funny that you say that because I had written down a quote. I got to find this because you wrote uh, early on in the book, be cheerful over grumpy. And I right. so, so reconcile that. Well, I you know. And I think in Trump's case, it's very hard right now because, you know, all these people are trying to destroy him. Right. 
I mean, I think, I think it'd be very hard to go through the kind of trials, the kind of total corruption that he is immersed in and be cheerful in the sense that Reagan was. Um, and I, and I, that I'm sympathetic to, but he needs to shape a campaign which offers hope more than fear and which offers the vision of a dramatically better future rather than simply staying mired in the current mess. So by that, do you mean that he needs to focus less on himself and less on the past and more on the future and more on voters? Yeah, I, I think probably 30% on the fight he's in and 70% on the future he would create. All right, folks, are you scared of the dark? Because <laughs> I can be sometimes. I know my kids get scared of the dark. But imagine going without power for a few hours in the middle of the night, uh, a few days, weeks, maybe even months. And there's all sorts of threats that are out there. I spent you know, time at the U.S. War College planning, doing contingency planning, seeing how people get ready for things. The one thing that you can do for yourself right now is go to fourpatriots.com slash Spicer. Check out the Patriot Power Generator 2000X. I have one. This is how I make sure that if something were to happen to me, I could plug in my refrigerator, my computers, and gosh knows those kids with the computers and the tablets, they would want those. Your phone, all the things that you rely on power on, medical devices that you may need, all of it can be done with the Patriot Power Generator. It can be powered through solar panels that come with it for free. You can bring it inside your house. It's portable. You can put it in your car and take it somewhere if you had to go somewhere, help out a neighbor or family member. No fumes inside. All of that gets powered with the Patriot Power Generator. And because of those solar power panels, you never have to worry about getting it recharged or refilled with gas. No, no, no. That's all taken care of with the Patriot Power Generator 2000X. Go to 4 patriots.com slash Spicer to check it out. This is the kind of thing that you need in your house when and if an emergency happens. Be prepared. Get the Patriot Power Generator 2000X at 4patriots.com slash Spicer. All right. So in 2012, if we can fast forward, you ran for president. You carried a lot of states. You were the front runner multiple times, but eventually you dropped out and you still had a a reservoir of, of support, people who are delegates you accumulated. Um, considering the current race right now, you know, how important is it to, to coalesce around what, what will be Donald Trump? I mean, Republicans keep trying to play bank shot scenarios where if this happens and then the moon falls out of the sky and a NASCAR picks right. it up and drives it around the track four times, it, Trump will be the nominee. How important is it for Republicans to accept that fact and say, he is our, our nominee, Biden or another person will be the opponent. We need to rally around him. Well, I think the earlier it happens, the better. I think uh, he, I, I wrote after New Hampshire that he would have the longest general election campaign in history. Uh, it, it'll be broken up by, by these court cases and efforts to destroy him uh, that I think are despicable and unconstitutional. Uh, but um, you know, I look. I this is you have you have to say two things about Donald Trump, uh, and you know him probably even better than I do because you were next to him as his press secretary. Uh, the the one is, it is astonishing that he's still standing. I mean, any normal person hammered as much as he's hammered would have at some point broken, and he just gets up every morning and gets pissed off. Uh, and goes back out and fights him. I mean, it, it's, I think it's truly one of the more amazing personal performances that we've seen in politics, uh, certainly in my lifetime and maybe in all of American history. Probably resembles Andrew Jackson more than anybody else. Uh, second, um, he has, I think, an intuitive feel for about 45 to 50% of the country at a level that is amazing. And what the left is doing is it's driving people towards him. So his potential base is getting bigger, not smaller. Um, I was with some people last night who just said, after the New York uh, decision, which was uh, grotesque, totally irresponsible, uh, by a judge who ought to be, frankly, kicked out of office. Uh, I mean, how do you get a $265 million fine in a fraud case in which there's not a single victim. <laughs> I mean, not a single person walked in and said, I was defrauded. Quite the opposite, uh, actually, right? I mean, 
<laughs> they yeah. were like, I mean, they we made, got paid. They made money. <laughs> yeah, that's what I mean. For example, the, the, the Deutsche Bank people actually made money out of the deal. Uh, so you look at that and you think, um, his ability, what, what's, what, what is happening, and I think he could be better at this than he is, but despite some of his weaknesses and despite some of his occasionally erratic moments, people look at what's happening and among Latinos and African-Americans, and actually, big surprise to me in the last week or two has been the shift among people under 30. And that's for a practical reason. Uh, Bidenism isn't working. They can't get a job. They can't buy a house. They can't afford a car. They ain't going on vacation. Uh, they're looking around and they're thinking, even though they're woke, being bankrupt woke is not as good as having money. Uh, something which Peter Drucker wrote, wrote about back around uh, 1969 when he said, it's great to be an environmentalist when you're 20 years old and when you're 30 and have three kids and you're uh, trying to buy a house, it's not quite as good. Uh, and I think what, you know, there's been a huge shift in the last month or so, as you know, partly triggered, I think, by the degree to which uh, Biden has mishandled uh, the Israeli terrorist fight uh, and, and partially by this, this sinking in that is this is just not working. Yeah, there's no question. And, and it's interesting because you you bring up Biden and I want to segue into this convention stuff. You you reminded everybody in the book about how in the not so distant future and not so distant past in the 60s up into the early 70s, uh, actually up till 76, that these conventions were contested. You went to the convention and the delegates played a much larger role in actually selecting them. Do you think on the Dem side that there's there's this massive speculation that this Chicago convention that the Democrats are going to have in August really will be an attempt to figure out how to move Joe Biden out of this? I doubt it. I mean, if you look at the numbers they just released, uh, I think he raised $46 million yeah. in January. I think uh, he raised 120 million. I may that may not be totally accurate. Something like 120 million in the fourth quarter, more than Barack Obama raised in his reelection effort at the same time period. Um, I mean, there is a Biden machine, and the Biden machine is what makes uh, this year very dangerous. I mean, no Republican should assume that just because Biden is is senile, incompetent, and has policies that are a disaster that he's going to be easy to beat because when you're spending $6 trillion a year in the federal budget, you are paying enough people that want to keep you there because they want to keep getting the money. Uh, and so I think Biden has uh, an enormous base of support, even though I think it's frightened support. I think with every passing month, they are more doubtful that he can win. But they, you know, if you, I'll give you a minor example that, that uh, Mark Stein has written about. Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Is, has one of the most famous, if not the most famous, political name uh, in the last half century. He is the first person in 55 years to not get Secret Service protection as a presidential candidate. Now, that is, I think, a deliberate act, like the degree to which the Biden team is working to keep no labels off the ballot in every single state, making them pay legal fees, making them fight their way on, uh, like the degree to which they're trying to lock up Donald Trump or bankrupt him or do both. Uh, what you have is a pretty big methodical system with the full power of the federal government and the full weight of the teachers union, the other unions, et cetera. Uh, I don't see them turning on Biden. Uh, and I don't see Biden right now losing by a big enough margin right now. Uh, for the, the, they're, they're worried, but they're not panicked. I mean, remember that Carter, who did beat Teddy Kennedy in the summer of 1980, and Ford, who had only been an appointed president, beat Reagan in 1976. So incumbent presidents inside their own party are very powerful. And I think that it will be very difficult to find somebody prepared to take Biden head on uh, as long as, unless, unless something really happens and it becomes so obvious that he's incompetent uh, right. that, that uh, the, even the Democrats are sickened. 
You look at the polling data, the Democrats have not begun to break from him. Independents have. And Republicans, of course, have always been against him. But but his most of his losses right now are among independents, not among Democrats. You just need them to come home. I, I want to something you said there just intrigued me because we have not seen the the Biden folks put out their numbers early this morning. The Republicans uh, are supposed to have them later tonight. But do you think that that considering the at least short term fundraising woes of both the RNC and the Trump campaign in terms of how much they're spending on legal fees and this New York decision? Uh, to go after his finances. I kept thinking to myself, as you were talking, at the end of 2016, I remember a conversation that Jared and some others had with the president said, hey, if you put in some extra money of your own right now, I think we can put this over the top and buy some additional ads, et cetera. This effort by the Democrats, though, I'm thinking of this as you're talking. This is probably... Like the idea is let's take away his ability to self-fund. Let's make sure that the RNC and those guys don't have the money and, and we'll overwhelm them. I mean, it it seems to me as though that I've never thought that resources would be a problem financially in a presidential race uh, in the last few cycles. Do you think it is going to be this time? Probably not. I mean, the, the Democrats will have more money. And, and if you add in the union efforts and everything else, they'll be bigger. But here, But here's their problem, which I have to say, I could not have predicted. I mean, one of the reasons I'm a historian is I can explain it after it happens. Uh, (laughs) But I may not be able to tell you before it happens. And I'm always one, I always watch these Sunday talk shows where so called experts who were totally wrong last week come on to explain to us this week why they know more than they knew last week. But anyway, uh, I mean, there, there are two things here that I think are among the things the news media can't bring itself to cover. The first is Donald Trump is news. I mean, whether it's something as stupid as gold sneakers, which I have to say as as a serious person, I found just appalling. But I remembered when when he was in the primaries, I remember at one point Romney made some comment that he wasn't a real businessman and he spent like 25 minutes bringing out different products, Trump water, Trump food, meats, et cetera. To prove, I mean, I'm watching that. This is like an infomercial, <laughs> and I'm thinking, you know, how can how can a serious candidate for the White House be doing this? But he knew what he was doing. Um, so the so the first point is, Trump generates so much news, and is so impossible to avoid that, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I used to watch like, and you were there in in the 16 campaign when he had he had you know, he had 15 good opponents. A bunch of them, you know, governors, senators, I mean, serious people. And they would spend all day raising money, and he would do an hour with Sean Hannity. Well, guess which was the greater value? Right. And he knew, and he knew it because he had done The Apprentice. I mean, he understood television, and he understood markets as well as anybody we've ever seen, certainly in the same league as Reagan. So the second thing is, and, and I'd be very curious to get your reaction, they have not found yet a single argument which shakes his supporters. Now, and it may well be that it's, I, I keep telling people, Trump is not a candidate. Trump is the leader of a movement. And that is a profoundly different relationship than being a candidate. Uh, and um, I, I'm really curious whether or not they can find any argument which, which drives him uh, below his core base. And among independents, the problem they've got is reality. You, you can run a million ads about the great job Joe Biden is doing, and then I go buy gasoline, or I go buy, uh, the other day, Costa uh, was picking up some hamburger uh, to uh, make spaghetti. And she said, this was like 50 or 60% more expensive. Yeah. And she's just, she's staring at this package of hamburger thinking, this is crazy. Well, how many ads does it take to convince her that it's not crazy? It's impossible. Uh, and so, and then, as you were saying a while ago, you, 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 you watch the evening news in Washington where last year they had over 1,000 carjackings in the city of Washington alone. Or you watch the evening news as a group of Venezuelan gang members beat up the local police. And I don't care what ads they put on the air you know that's not working. Yeah. 
No, it's, and, and you're right. I mean, he's, I, I joke with people all the time where they'll call me and be like, oh, this latest comment. And I'm like, okay, you really think that after what he has said about this person and this person and, and this, the Billy Bush tape, that that's the thing that's going to get on me? I, I don't think so. Um, it's interesting though, we talk about reaching out to folks. There's obviously a big issue with, with minorities and women. In the book, you talked a lot about how Atlanta used to go 60%, the, the black vote was 60% for Republicans. And it wasn't until the 60 and Nixon that it changed. If you're Trump, uh, recent polls suggest that you actually can do very well with, with blacks, uh, especially black men who are relating more to you. How much should there be an effort to outreach to, to specifically like say suburban women where the media want to talk about or to other minority groups? Or is it just, hey, be yourself and let them come to you. Well, I, I was very encouraged in his speech in Iowa after the caucus, after he won the caucus. Everybody when, was. Well, and he spent three or four paragraphs talking about the cities. And I thought that was very important. Yeah. Uh, it also is important with suburban women. Uh, a Republican candidate who sincerely wants to save Philadelphia will do better in the suburbs. Uh, and my hope is, and we'll, I mean, the proof will be in the pudding, but my hope is that you're going to get six or seven Trump speeches in places like Chicago, um, Milwaukee, uh, Pittsburgh, um, Detroit, uh, communicating that there are policies of safety and policies of prosperity and policies of opportunity. And I think that that will have an effect in the black community. I also think that... Uh, when, when they done, the, one of their mistakes was getting the mugshot because Trump correctly looked angry in the mugshot. And I am told, uh, these are random stories, but I am told that there are black barber shops that have framed the mugshot and hung it on the wall. Really? On the, on the grounds that if the man is after Trump, they identify with him because they've had the man after them. Oh, fascinating. All right. I know your time is tight. I, I, there was so much more I wanted to get into about you, but I can't with the current environment. The last thing I just want to ask you, because it's, it's, I mean, like I said, I will, I got to tell people, if you're a political junkie, you have to read March the Majority. I, like I said, I've got all the Gingrich books. I got all the Gaylord books too. I've got the Go Pack tapes. This is a must. <laughs> I was very uh, impressed with the opening. Oh, listen, <laughs> my wife was like, you got to, if it comes out of the bins, it stays out of the bins. But well, I have, every, I, I have the I, pins I, I, you want. I, I if you ever need I, anything, any original stuff from the contract, promises kept, promises made, I <laughs> I have it. Well, I mean, I mean, we I just want you to know, we're actually, Bliss and I are actually having dinner with Joe and Molly Gaylord tonight. And so I'm going to have to report to him uh, that you have done, you have done well by him. Well, I'll tell you this. Here's a real quick funny story because I got to get this last question in, but I'm going to tell you, I tell people all the time. And Newt Gingrich came up and did an event for Ed Munster in 1994 in the campaign, Congressional Second District. Everybody, for, for the right reasons, wants to sit at the Newt Gingrich table. Uh, and I was a field staffer at the time. So that wasn't even, even in the realm of possibility. I sat there and said, I want to know where Joe Gaylord is sitting and sat next to him. And I tell people all the time because I'm not a donor. I didn't have any money. And then that's not my role, as you know. But so I knew right. that there's no way, right? I, I got a picture with you. I think that was huge. But my thought was be smart enough about being, you know, get not enough people are going to know at that time who Joe Gaylord was. I did. And I was like, I want to be next to the guy who's telling the guy. So you can tell Joe right. Gaylord. But well, here's my I'll last question. The, the last thing I want to just ask you is, you were on the short list in 2020 to, to uh, serve or be on the ticket with Donald Trump. If, if he had to ask you right now, who's the best person for me uh, going into this election as a former president, what would you tell him? Well, I'd say that there are a number of really good people. Like? Uh, like Elise Stefanik, who did such an amazing job taking apart uh, the Harvard uh, president, like the governor of South Dakota, who has done, I think, a very, <clears throat> for, for pure advertising and promotion, she certainly wants to be on the short list. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I just, I think that they're, you know, I think Tim Scott is, is a terrific talent uh, and uh, is, is, has genuine potential. Um, so I think there are a number of people like that. 
that uh, the president the president has a pretty deep bench uh, that he can reach into. Uh, and I think he probably has the right basic idea, which is you want somebody who could be president because that it is possible that you'd be replaced and they'd have to be ready from minute one. Uh, you would like somebody uh, who, who won't hurt you in the election. The very few vice presidents actually help, but it's nice if they don't hurt. Right. Uh, and you want somebody who shares your values. So un- unlike what happened with Reagan and Bush, where Bush literally wiped out all of the Reaganites the day he became president, because Bush never once, uh, despite eight years of standing next to Reagan, he never once understood what Reagan was doing. Right. Okay. Uh, so you'd like to have somebody who actually is on your side. I mean, I actually personally think Sarah Huckabee Sanders would be very, very good. I'd, I'd be very comfortable if he picked her. Okay. All right. Uh, Newt Gingrich, always a, uh, an honor to have you on the show with me. Thank you for all your all you do. Uh, go get March the Majority, an amazing book. Thanks for being with us. Thank you. What a great conversation. I always am so honored to have Newt on. I always admired him. And now that he comes on the show, it's 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 truly an honor and a blessing. Uh, check out the book. Tomorrow, Robbie Staubach joins us. He's got a new film out, plus what he thinks we need to be doing as a movement. Uh, join us at our VIP site, seanspicershow.com slash VIP. Follow us, subscribe, and share on all those platforms, YouTube, Rumble, Spotify, and Apple. We'll see you back here tomorrow on The Sean Spicer Show. Well, if you enjoyed this content, make sure to like this video, subscribe, and click the notification bell to get more.